Tonight on Currents News, the Bishop of Brooklyn is strongly refuting a second allegation of abuse dating back almost half a century ago. There are some details about the same lawyer behind both accusations that we want you to know. New Yorkers screaming for justice here at the Brooklyn Memorial for George Floyd. I'm Emily Druby and that is coming up. Freedom at long last for a Navy vet. His nightmare of captivity is over. And children are still studying for their sacraments. The coronavirus can't stop religious education. I got to learn a lot more about my earth, how it was created, my savior. Plus, today is the Feast of Christ the Priest, a special moment to pray for priests. The new starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. The Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas DiMarzio, is calling a second accusation of abuse from decades ago outrageous and libelous. And he is contemplating legal action to defend himself. The same lawyer is behind both allegations, and there are some details about him that we want you to know. We come together at this time of prayer. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio once again defending himself against a sexual abuse allegation. The Associated Press reports the accuser claims DiMarzio repeatedly sexually abused him in the 1970s at Holy Rosary Church in Jersey City, starting when he was just six years old. The bishop denies that, saying in a statement, there is absolutely no truth to this allegation. I deny this outrageous and libelous claim. This is clearly another attempt to destroy my name and discredit what I have accomplished in my service to God and his people, including my efforts to fight the scourge of sexual abuse. I have retained counsel and am contemplating filing a lawsuit against those responsible for these accusations, which have no basis in fact. I am ready, willing, and able to go to trial to defend myself. The AP reports a lawsuit may be filed by the law offices of Mitchell Garabedian, the attorney best known for representing sexual abuse victims in Boston during the clerical abuse crisis in 2002. Last November, Garabedian told the Associated Press he was planning to file a lawsuit on behalf of another client accusing the bishop of abuse, but as of today, no lawsuit has been filed. That accusation came right after Bishop DiMarzio completed his Vatican-appointed examination into the Bishop of Buffalo for allegations that Richard Malone failed to report abusive priests. Malone resigned in December. At the time, Garabedian represented Siobhan O'Connor, the former executive assistant to Malone, and the whistleblower who leaked records from the Buffalo Diocese's archives. Garabedian, meanwhile, may face defamation charges after a federal judge in Pennsylvania recently ruled that the lawyer never intended to sue a teacher his client accused of sexual abuse. That may clear the way for a defamation lawsuit against Garabedian. The case is potentially similar to the allegations Garabedian has made against Bishop DiMarzio. In another case represented by Garabedian, a Massachusetts pastor has now been cleared of sexual abuse allegations and has been reinstated to his post. Father Peter Gorey had always denied any wrongdoing and an independent investigation could not substantiate the accusation. Also, after the Archdiocese of Philadelphia paid a six-figure settlement to another client of Garabedian's who alleged he was abused by the late Father John J. Bradley in the 1980s, just last week, Garabedian blamed another priest with the same name who is still living. Hours later, the lawyer admitted his very public mistake. Bishop DiMarzio's attorney, Joseph Hayden, told the AP both allegations against the bishop are more than 40 years old and the accusers are each seeking $20 million from the Newark Archdiocese. He says in both cases he has uncovered conclusive evidence of Bishop DiMarzio's innocence. Bishop DiMarzio is nationally recognized as a leader in protecting children from abuse. Through his leadership, the Diocese of Brooklyn has strong programs in place to protect minors. Some of the measures include creating the Office of Victims 
victim assistance to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The offer, office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Every employee of the Brooklyn Diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. In the Brooklyn Diocese, Bishop DiMarzio meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Hope and Healing Mass. To contact the diocese's toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line, dial 888-634-4499. Our other big story tonight, the killing of George Floyd today in Brooklyn. Words of peace at a memorial service attended by George's brother, along with city and state leaders. Currents News' Emily Druby has the story from Cadman Plaza. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! On Thursday, a crowd of New Yorkers screamed George Floyd's last words. Thousands filled Cadman Plaza Park in downtown Brooklyn to remember Floyd, who died in Minneapolis last week. Four cops are facing charges in connection with his killing. George's brother Terrence joined Mayor Bill de Blasio, New York Attorney General Letitia James, and many others at the memorial. Terrence briefly silenced by his emotion as he stepped up to the mic. But I want to thank God. Because at the end of the day, my brother's gone. But the Floyd name still lives on. Terrence praised protesters but condemned those who have contributed to the widespread destruction. I'm proud of the protests, but I'm not proud of the destruction. My brother wasn't about that. The Floyds is a God fearing family. People from all over New York City gathered to honor Floyd's memory, including Anthony Williamson, who was leading chants. It's all about justice. We all should be treated fairly. We should never be judged by the color of our skin. Franciscan Brothers of Brooklyn were also there to show their support. We're with them. We, we're, we, they're in our classrooms. They're in our, our centers. Um, so the church needs to be here. We need to be here. Filled with inspiration by the words of Pope Francis, who just one day prior condemned racism and prayed for Floyd. And when we say we're pro-life, this is one of those areas that we have to be about. And we often forget that. So I'm very grateful because that is a prophetic voice. And it's one that we needed to hear. Memorials and memorial services will be held in other states over the next few days as the country continues to mourn the loss of George Floyd. In downtown Brooklyn, Emily Druby, Currents News. The FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force is investigating the stabbing of an NYPD cop in Brooklyn. The officer was on anti-looting patrol along Church Avenue when the suspect approached and plunged a knife into his neck. Other police rushed to the scene. Shots were fired, striking two officers and the suspect. The three cops are hospitalized in stable condition. The suspect is listed as critical. Hours later in the East Village, another man with a knife was shot after he menaced two cops at a deli on East 10th Street. The suspect is in the hospital. Four cops were treated for minor injuries. The citywide curfew led to about 180 arrests overnight as cops cracked down on protesters out after 8 p.m. The number of people locked up is down by about 100 from the night before. Police Commissioner Dermot Shea said the key was most protests were peaceful, even though crowds were larger. Before the George Floyd Memorial got underway in Brooklyn, the casket containing his body arrived at North Central University in Minnesota. Family, friends and guests gathered there to honor him. Daryl Forges has that part of the story from Minneapolis. Through song and prayer, the memory of George Floyd is honored. Can y'all please say his name? while friends and family celebrate his life. I love my brother, man. We had so many memories, you know, together. His death inspired demonstrators across the globe to demand for racial equality. And in police brutality. No peace. All four Minneapolis police officers involved with his arrest, now in custody, charged in connection with his killing. George Floyd changed American policing forever. And by that, the message has now grown to a nation begging for unity and healing. 
The hope of lasting change is on the minds of many. Seeking justice, seeking justice, seeking justice for the family of George Floyd. As Floyd's family prepares to say a final farewell to the man they loved. Everybody wants justice. We want justice for George. He's going to get it. Daryl Forges, Currents News. Two of the white men accused of killing unarmed black jogger Ahmad Arbery appeared in court today. That's Travis McMichael. He's accused of firing the shotgun that left Arbery dead outside of Brunswick, Georgia. His father, Gregory, is also charged with murder. William Bryan, who recorded the shooting video, decided not to appear. During today's hearing, a police investigator testified Bryan repeatedly hit Arbery with his truck as the jogger tried to get away. The U.S. Bishop's point man in the fight against racism is calling the evil a real and present danger that must be met head on. Bishop Shelton Fabre says he's heartbroken to watch videos of African-American men being killed. We cannot turn a blind eye to these atrocities and yet still try to profess to respect every human life. He warned that indifference must end and too many communities around the country feel their voices are not being heard. The leader of the U.S. Bishops Conference, Archbishop Jose Gomez, is hearing directly from Pope Francis about the racial unrest in America. The Holy Father telephoning with support for the U.S. Church's pastoral response to the Floyd protests. El Paso Bishop Mark Seitz, who knelt and prayed for George Floyd's soul, also received a call from the Pope. Francis congratulated him for the prayerful demonstration. The bishop said he responded that it was important to show solidarity with those suffering. China is preventing Hong Kong from remembering today's anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. But that isn't stopping Catholics from keeping vigil. The Hong Kong church is holding special masses at various locations tonight. In 1989, a weeks-long Chinese student uprising ended when the Chinese military fired on protesters in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Estimates of those killed ranged into the thousands. A U.S. Navy vet is a free man tonight after nearly two years in Iranian captivity. Michael White is flying back to America tonight. He was arrested in July of 2018 while visiting his girlfriend in Iran. The Iranian regime sentenced White to a 10-year prison term on charges he insulted Iran's supreme leader. At the same time, the U.S. released an Iranian doctor from custody. He'd been charged with violating American sanctions. There's a lot more news headed your way. A blessing in disguise. How continuing religious education at home has been an uplifting lesson for some families. Plus, millions more on the unemployment line. The lowdown on jobless numbers coming up. And a game changer for nursing home residents. What they're doing in Massachusetts. Don't go away. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Despite a pandemic, parents are still trying to give their kids a sense of normalcy, helping them continue their education even when at home. For Catholic parents, that includes keeping their spiritual education going. Jessica Eastope reports on how the Diocese of Brooklyn is offering help. In the rush to get school moved online, many parents became their children's teachers. Yes, they all pray together at meal time. A job Stella and Fabian Uweche take very seriously. Teaching is really my thing. <laughs> and so I've been able to, um, this time around, it's just a different, it's different because now it's my kids I'm teaching. Tiffany, what are you working on? For the last few months, the Uweches have been balancing jobs, their four children's schoolwork and CCD, religious education for kids. I feel like it's my job to do it. It's our job as parents to introduce mm -hmm. our kids to the church and make sure that they are brought up in the right way. To Christ our Lord, amen. Audrey, Tiffany, and Brian say their mom and dad are good teachers, but they miss their CCD community. Audrey, what do you like most about CCD? I got to learn a lot more about my earth, how it was created, 
my savior. Stella and Fabian are prioritizing faith formation at home and relying on guidance from the diocese. In some cases, the catechist could convey to the parents the work that needed to be done. In some cases, parishes were set up to provide religious education online. Theodore Musco is the secretary for evangelization and catechesis for the Brooklyn Diocese. He said he's blown away by how much parents have stepped up and enthusiastically worked toward developing their children's spirituality. Parents took the time and the energy to do what they could to help their children grow in faith. That's also called what? Communion. Good. For the witches, their faith goes beyond attending Sunday Mass at Christ the King in Jamaica. They incorporate it into everyday life. And during the week, we try to do the Bible stories, use them as bedtime stories. When it would have been easy to let religious education slide, with a little collaboration and a lot of love, the witches made family. their faith stronger. Who are the only family? Mary. Jesus, Joseph. Good job. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Here are some more headlines. New York City could enter reopening phase two in July. Mayor Bill de Blasio is saying offices, stores, and places like barbershops could be back in business with restrictions as early as the beginning of July, and restaurants could offer outdoor dining. Around the rest of the country, almost 20,000 new infections were counted on Wednesday. Most of the hot spots are in the south, but officials are warning the large George Floyd protests could have an impact. The World Health Organization is saying COVID-19 is not mutating. The experts are finding no signs the virus is getting more severe or transmittable, yet it still remains dangerous and people should not become complacent. COVID cases are surging in Latin America as nations are preparing to resume more normal activities. In Rio, churches and other businesses are set to reopen on Tuesday. This as coronavirus deaths set a new one-day record. The state announced there have been over 300 COVID deaths in the last 24 hours, bringing the toll up to 6,000. Meantime, Mexico now has over 100,000 confirmed cases of COVID. That's right after reopening parts of their economy. Authorities say 17% of those cases are still active. American workers are still getting hit hard because of the coronavirus crisis, says almost 2 million new unemployment claims came in last week. The Department of Labor says 1.9 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits, leading to a total of 42 million people now jobless because of this pandemic. The Labor Department says weekly claims never topped the million mark before COVID brought the economy to a standstill. Meantime, the CDC is concerned too many people are avoiding the emergency room because of the pandemic. This after new info says visits to the ER have dropped by 42 percent. The organization also says fewer people are calling 911 for heart attack or stroke symptoms, which could lead to long term health consequences. They reaffirm patients should not hesitate to seek emergency care. A sign of relief for nursing home residents in Massachusetts. The facilities are getting the go ahead to open their doors to family and friends. Beth Germano reports the move is helping seniors reconnect in several ways. You remember who loved you, right? It's the first time Bobby Pace has seen his mother face to face in two and a half months at Seaview Retreat in Rowley. I say, hey, mom, mom, it's me, Bobby. Yeah, and she smiled. A smile he has missed from his mother who has dementia and prefers we not show her face. Today, no hugging or kissing, but a connection, finally. Once I started talking to her and calling her name a few times, then she remembered me. Then she remembered me and she kept saying, I love you, I love you. For the first time since the outbreak, nursing homes that can provide an open space like this can facilitate family visits with proper social distancing. For Maria Serena at Charlwell House in Norwood, it's the first time she's been out in two months, confined to her room, and we were her first visitors. I'll feel great just being here with you people. I talk to myself and tell myself that, you know, this isn't forever. It's being called a game changer for nursing home residents. Only two family members can visit at a time. They have to have an appointment and come wearing a mask. A lot of people don't, don't get to see their family much when they're here to begin with, and then not being able to see them at all has just been 
so detrimental. It's been lonely for Maria with no communal meals or games and until now allowed only phone calls from her sons. I have anxiety, uh, you know, alone and uh, that adds to it a little bit. No doubt it, it, it bringing her back a little bit. Bobby Pace worried his mother was confused and felt abandoned, but his daily visits will now be a breath of fresh air. That was Beth Germano reporting Massachusetts has seen more than 7,000 deaths due to COVID. Volunteers are gearing up for a big food giveaway at St. Therese of Lezou Parish in Brooklyn. Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens will hand out 4,500 bags of food tomorrow, including dry staple goods, produce and fresh chicken. The pop-up food pantry will start at 9.30 a.m. and go until supplies run out. As the transition to opening churches in the Diocese of Brooklyn begins, the schedule of live masses on Net TV, New York's Catholic station, is being modified starting on June 15th. The liturgies are on the air Sunday and throughout the week. The full schedule is listed at netny.tv. Still to come on Currents News, priests need your prayers. Why today is the perfect day to offer them. And it looked more like a party than a protest. How police responded to it when we come back. Today marks a special day for clergy around the world. The Feast of Christ the Priest, meant to help Catholics pray for their spiritual fathers. Melissa Butts reports from Rome on how this celebration came into existence. When Benedict XVI concluded the year for priests in 2010, Cardinal Antonio Cagnazzare suggested that he include in the liturgical calendar a feast to help Catholics reflect on the priesthood and pray for priests. The Pope accepted, and since 2012, bishops' conferences can request permission to celebrate the Feast of Christ Priest every year on the Thursday after Pentecost. The devotion was strongly promoted by the founders of the Congregation of the Oblates, Spanish Bishop José María García Laguera and Mother Maria del Carmen Hidalgo de Caviedes. They had an insight. It would do so much good for these priests if they could celebrate this feast. It's a day for them to contemplate themselves in Christ the priest. They reflect on how to be priests in Jesus Christ. They contemplate their vocation, their priestly love in the liturgy, in the Word of God. Those days, the essence of the priesthood is brought into focus. Thirteen Episcopal conferences and the Vatican Basilica celebrate the feast each year. In places where the Congregation of the Oblate Sisters of Christ Priest are present, the celebration includes large gatherings of priests from all over the diocese. It's a feast for them to remember the depth of their mission and to renew their surrender. It's also an expression of gratitude. Just a few days ago, the Pope published a letter he wrote to priests in Rome to help them during this delicate phase of the pandemic. In Rome, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Finally tonight, there were no clashes between cops and protesters at one demonstration in Nebraska, unless you'd call this a dance battle. <laughs> Nothing like a little Cupid shuffle to bring some harmony to the streets of Lincoln. Also, police and black community leaders there signed an agreement. They plan to hold monthly community meetings to discuss concerns and complaints about the police department. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.